How you guys doing today? It's Anthony Ganji. Welcome to another episode of Tear Talk. Guys, great discussion today. We're going to talk about 11 things you will see or deal with in corrections. Now, guys, you're going to see and deal with a lot more than just 11 things, but these are just things to scratch the surface. These are things to give you an idea of what you're going to be walking into. Again, you're never going to be ready, but this is just an effort to prepare you. My guests today are going to be Joe Paponio and Russ Hamilton. But before we get to them, I just want to let you know I got inmate manipulation decoded on the market. This book is available on Amazon. It's used for training all across the country. If you guys get a chance, get your hands on this book. This book's got great information and helps you deal with the games that inmates play. We also have How to Succeed in Corrections. This book is published by Blue 360 Media. You can only get this book through Blue 360 Media. The link to that is in the description. And this just has tons of advice for myself and others in how to navigate a successful career in corrections. It's filled with tons of knowledge, and it really stays true to some of the core values that we need to hold dear in corrections. The purpose behind writing this book, Inmate Manipulation and Decoded, and the other book I'm about ready to introduce you to is because we have senior staff that are leaving. So I wanted to make sure we still stay connected to those values. And then we have tips for new correctional officers and their supervisors. Another book published by Blue 360 Media. It's just got tons of advice. It's really, these books, guys, they partner well together, but these books are, are not just meant to introduce people into the profession, but really meant for us to have discussion. That's the key and really get an understanding of the world we're getting ready to enter or the world that we are already in. I still learn every day. So learning never stops. Uh, so with that said, let me get Russ on. Uh, he is Russ and Joe will be my guests for today's show. There he is, Russ. What's going on, Russ? Hey there, Anthony. How goes it, sir? Good. You mind introducing yourself to our audience, please? Uh, of course. My name is uh, Russ Hamilton. I am a former and retired sergeant from California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation. I am also a former uh, senior juvenile correctional officer. I currently work for a private company where we do re-entry and rehabilitation work uh, for a county jail where I am a case manager there and also for a probation department. So that about sums that up. I am also a uh, founder of Keepers of Chaos, which is a Facebook um, venue for everybody that's in the field at all. Um, you know, and that includes, you know, everyone from the officers all the way to teachers, doctors, uh, nurses and whatnot. And I am also, of course, uh, most proudly a contributor here at Tear Talk. Yes. And we love having you, Russ. And I love that quote that you put on uh, Keepers of Chaos. To improve is to change. To be perfect is to change often. No, I'm, I'm joking. It's Winston <laughs> Churchill. <laughs> I'm trying to really get Russ to buy into the I have a life. lot of quotes that I can't even remember, so, you know. <laughs> that sounded like you could have did it. Uh, let, let, let's get Joe. What's up, Joe? Hey, how's it going, guys? Good. Good to have you, Joe, man. Hey, Joe, you mind introducing yourself again to our audience? Absolutely. My name is Joe Pomponio. I'm a retired lieutenant with the Texas Department of Criminal Justice for 30 years, uh, currently working as an assistant jail administrator in our local county jail and panel member here for Tier Top. Yes, and we love having you, Joe. And, and, and guys, so the reason uh, why uh, Russ thought of this topic, I also think, is because even as senior staff, we become desensitized. So two good perspectives here is one, to introduce rookies and let them know what you could be seeing or people on the outside trying to come in. Or even as senior staff, to kind of uh, remember how you felt when you first came in. And if you have a rookie who's dealing with something, uh, maybe it's their first time being exposed to something, being able to relate to the first time you did, uh, you went through it uh, matters. Because I think as you move through the profession, obviously the amount of time you see these things, uh, you unfortunately become desensitized. And sometimes we translate that to uh, the people we work around, not realizing that as for rookies, this could be their first time. So you don't want to be cold to how their initial reaction could be to something uh, that we're going to express here. So again, it's 11 things you'll see or deal with in corrections. Now, Russ did come up with this. So out of curiosity, Russ, what would be the importance of doing this now? Well, you know, there's a lot of things that come to mind. And, you know, I was just trying to think of um, something to kind of, you know, relay to the public at large, as well as to the rookies who really haven't done anything yet, the kind of things that this job can encompass. And, you know, um, there's some of it, you know, that's, you know, goes all the way from the mundane that we're going to talk about all the way to the absolutely, you know, horrifying. 
and and even macabre. And so I just think that, you know, being able to, you know, relay some of the things that um, that we've all seen, the, the three of us here, and to, you know, kind of, you know, prep those rookies. Hey, that day is coming when you're going to see some shit that nobody else sees, um, you know, especially sometimes on an almost daily basis. Um, and then, you know, for the public at large to, you know, maybe have a better appreciation. You know, we stand there in the gap and we view these things and we experience them and we put ourselves in harm's way so that you don't have to be there. And I think that that's something that um, is is kind of, you know, lacking uh, when we talk about different things on some of these channels and stuff. And I would just like for the um, I just like for the public at large to know that and maybe be able to appreciate it a little bit more. I, I, and I love that. And guys, uh, we broke into, as I said, we have 11. Some of them may kind of fall into each other, but we're going to try to make them uh, separate uh, categories because we believe that they do have, uh, may require, or they do have a different type of reaction from us. I think that's what we kind of did. We kind of did it based on our reaction. So yes, I mean, we're working in a prison that or jail that's going to have a lot of crazy things, but we separated the categories more on how we may react to those different things. So the first thing right off the bat, and let's just get it out there, is violence, but not self-imposed just yet. We'll get to that in a little bit later. Uh, but right now we're talking about violence. So we'll go with Russ first, then Joe. And mind you guys, this is an effort to be prepared because even as senior staff, you're never fully ready. You're just prepared that something could happen. And then you got to trust in your ability to adapt and adjust and make sense of it all as it's happening, unfortunately, in, in, in real time. Uh, but Russ, let's talk about violence that's not self-imposed. Let's 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 get down to some of your stories and maybe the first time you, you dealt with an incident where uh, it was a violent maybe altercation or even the, the killing of, of, of another inmate or a staff member, God forbid. Yeah, so um, I've been involved in a, a lot of different things, you know, uh, a lot more maybe than some, a lot less maybe than some others. Uh, but, you know, um, there's just this, you know, overarching, you know, uh, tendency towards violence in the in the prisons and jails. And that's that's just the way it is. It's the nature of the individual that we incarcerate and uh, and uh, uh, the STGs, the gangs and so forth. And uh, the first thing that I was ever involved with, I had just arrived on shift and uh, they'd had a big fight down on the lower yard and they were moving everybody, you know, uh, back up and they really honestly i didn't even know that um that they did it wrong at the time they moved too many people at once all at the same time and uh they just filtered into the they filtered into the block and it was five tiers and all of a sudden you know everybody was kung fu fighting in there and it was just crazy going off and uh right above me there was a, a female officer and she was trying to separate these two guys that were just going at it and uh i ran up the stairwell and i was dumb and there was a, a couple guys uh, there's more than a couple guys there were several guys in that stairwell maybe like you know five seven ten something like that and as i was trying to get up to her i wasn't cognizant of the fact that just because this was among inmates didn't mean that they weren't going to put some uh, cheap shots on me which they proceeded to do managed to get myself extricated from them and uh ran up there and these guys were still going at it me and the uh me and the uh other officer we managed to pull those guys apart and that was also the first time i had done any violence in my career uh whereas i i slung this guy around and uh his face ended up uh hitting the bar and broke his nose and there was just blood everywhere <laughs> and you know i just remember that vividly and that was the very first time but you know, that wasn't the only time, man. You know, everything from, uh, you know, being attacked um, to uh, seeing my staff attacked to uh, seeing inmates attack each other in large groups. You know, um, I've been involved in some massive, massive riots and, you know, people are in there fighting. Sometimes they've got weapons and they're stabbing, you know, sometimes broomsticks. And um, that just tends to be, you know, what we face. Um, I remember one specific incident where some guys attacked another guy and uh anyway it was all bad but you know after everything was kind of like shooken out you know everyone looked okay 
the one guy he had like a little bloody spot on his chin and the next day when i was in seg because but these guys in seg because that's what we do this guy tells me he can't move his head so i took him over to the infirmary and they x-rayed him and he had a shank about that long that had glanced off that little tiny hole in his chin and was resting at the base of his skull and i took him out to the i took him out to the hospital and they had to open him up boom like that and peel all of that back and be able to get that shank out and i had my little you know evidence envelope and stuff there and you know those are just things that we see a lot of you know and that one's kind of maybe a little bit out of pocket a little the norm but we see so much and so i just wanted to be able to convey to people what it is that we do what it is that we see yeah like for me i did start my career at a female facility so uh, the violence uh, was there, but but yeah, but not as extreme. I think for the female facility, it was more self interest behavior, which we will go to. But don't get me wrong; I mean, they could have their moments too. Uh, but obviously, since then, I have worked in maximum security prisons, and I have seen the results of some serious uh, altercations, both with and without a weapon. And I would tell you, uh, for rookies uh, coming in. Uh, what gets to me still is the means that they can carry out these violent assaults and then also the uh, outcome of what those violent assaults can lead to. Uh, I, I, I think I, I have seen some stuff where, you know, recently we had that video that we show where the guy just hit the officer with the uh, barbell, you know, just basically just ridiculous in, 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 in the, the assault and, and you're sitting there and, you know, at some at, at some thought, I think for me, even if it, even if it's an inmate uh, on inmate concern, I still think that that could still happen to me. You know, it, it, it's not so much the position that I'm in, but rather if this guy's able to do that to another human being, you know, you know, what makes that what makes me not think he can't do that to me. So sometimes I'm also uh, just taken back by their willingness to commit that act and their disregard for the life uh, that they are literally just pounding. I mean, I have seen fights where uh, once the inmate gets the best of the other inmate, they stop. Or once the officers come in and, you know, do what they got to do, people comply. But then you see the other side where they don't, where the inmate is clear, clearly helpless and unresponsive. And this person goes in even deeper and deeper, deeper. It's like, whoa, that's a whole different ball game. Um, but having said that, I think for me, what gets to me is, as I mentioned, not just what I see or how they carried out or the outcome, but also, I, I guess, trying to understand the mindset of an individual that could be so filled with rage that even when um, the threat has sort of been neutralized, they continue to go on top and on top to totally obliterate uh, that individual as if there's a message that got to be put out there or they're showcasing. And, uh, and then the support, the support that surrounds them for going that extra mile is also something that is tough because when you're trying to go ahead and be the voice of reason, uh, you know, they could give two shits about what you're saying. They care about what's being said in the background from their peers. So try dealing with de-escalating a concern when, when the expectation from the other side is keep it going, keep it going, you know, whatever. So I, I, I think that's uh, something that you obviously prepared for, but uh, truly may not be able to be ready for. Uh, what's your What's your thoughts on this, Joe, when it comes to violence? Not self-imposed, though. Well, you know, everybody everybody watches those TV shows and, you know, like uh, Jail and, you know, all these all these law enforcement shows where you see these simple one-on-one -on -one fights. And, you know, you're, you're taught about these fights in the academy. You know, fights will happen, you know, so be prepared. You know, what you're not prepared for is, you know, fights when, when weapons are involved. Um, you know, uh, just uh, what gets me still to this day, you know, and, and I'll never forget my first my first uh, fight with a weapon where there were serious bodily injuries. You know, guy had put, you know, three razors on a tongue depressor with tape and he waited for the other offender to come into the day room. When he entered, man, he sliced them from the from the top of the ear all the way through the bottom of his jaw. And I mean, you literally see jawbone and and everything. And this guy's pumping blood and. Yeah, we managed to get him to the infirmary and uh, go down to to restrain the other offender. And and what got me out of everything wasn't the fact that he committed the act. I mean, 
yeah, the act was horrendous. Um, but how eerily calm he was. Mm. I mean, just placed his hands behind his back, no tremor to him whatsoever. I mean, shit, just from the adrenaline alone, I, you know, my hands were shaking. It, it seemed like it, it took me forever to get the handcuffs on him, but how eerily calm he was and how monotone and just how level he was after the incident is, I think that's something that got me the most. I'm, Cause I'm thinking, damn, this dude just sliced this guy from his ear down, damn near down to his throat. Um, you know, we're literally packing gauze, holding pressure. We're holding this guy's head from one side and putting pressure on this wound, walking him down to the infirmary. And I'm, we're just watching this dude get weak from blood loss. And, you know, to be that eerily calm after committing an act like that, that, that I think that probably is what played on my mind worse, you know, and, and it's not, like I said, it's not the act itself. I mean, the act itself is shocking. You know, don't get me wrong. That's not something they, they really prepare you for in an academy. But, you know, they don't they don't really prepare you for the after effects, you know, for something like that. You know, it's it, it, it was it, that kind of hit home with me. That was more realistic than anything I ever encountered in my life. Well, yeah, I, I think when you're on the outside looking in, I, I think it's the human like it's crazy what what we see humans are willing to do to each other and i think that's something that's hard to turn off when you're on the outside when i was at the female facility i had a woman heat up water and sugar in a microwave for about nine minutes and just throw it at another female and that was tough because obviously we had to handcuff the victim because she's pulling her skin as she's mm -hmm. trying to uh you know, manage the pain and i think the difference between women and male facilities but guys by the way nothing's 100 percent is men may be a little bit more uh, impulsive when it comes to violence, even though they could also plan their stuff out. Don't get me wrong on that. But they, they, any sign of disrespect in a prison at a male facility can easily become uh, a physical altercation where women, they plan it out more. You know, they may have a verbal altercation and then it goes quiet and you think it's good. And then 10 minutes later or 20 minutes or even days later, you know, women never forget. You know, they, they, you know, they could be perfectly fine. <laughs> Best of friends. Now I'm not saying that doesn't uh, bleed into both sides, but for the most part of my experience, I find men, they challenge disrespect immediately with a physical altercation and women will internalize it a little bit more and then eventually plan something out, but nothing's a hundred percent. That's just, you know, my perspective. Hey Russ, you had a yeah. thought you wanted to mention. I saw that. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I just uh, just sitting here, and and you know, Joe's talking about this thing that that he went through, and uh, you know, um, when I first thought this subject up today, you know, now it's just like all these different things are you know cascading back, and you know, just the um, you know, he talks about the use of a weapon. I remember uh, me and uh, and my partner, Officer uh, Dennis, one time we responded to a one on one, and we were probably. We were probably a hundred yards away and uh, the victim was screaming the whole time we were responding and there was no weapon involved, but this guy had broke every bone in this guy's face so much so that um, when I did the uh, identification to get him out um, to the ambulance, I could not use his ID card because that's one of the things when someone's going out by ambulance, you ID them. And I couldn't do it. And I had to utilize, I, I looked at his, I looked at his back and sure enough, man, you know, he had his name blasted on the back there and it matched the ID that I had, but just the callousness when you think about that. And I had never, um, uh, never before and never since have I ever heard a man scream like that just this long wailing shrieking and i mean and it was over and over and over again and it was just something because you know it, uh, it's going to take us you know probably you know 14 15 seconds uh to cover that but the but the shrieking didn't stop even after my partner pushed the guy away and i and i handcuffed him um it still it just went on for for many minutes even as we even as we got him into the ambulance and so, um, you know, and, and, you know, I would think, man, I could never forget that. And now I'm, I'm just shocked that I remembered it after all these years. Yeah. I, I, and guys, if you're a rookie guys, mind you, uh, it's not something that you want to be 
hit with at the beginning of your career, but it could happen. Uh, don't find yourself discouraged to the point where you um, decide not to move forward after that experience. Sometimes that could be a good wake up call. It brings you into reality. Uh, that's why I say you have to be prepared for it. You're never ready, but you have to be prepared for it. Um, but you know, you could make that into a tremendous learning lesson as long as you're honest with the feelings, as long as you're able to share those feelings, and then obviously be ready because there'll be another one probably soon after. Um, hey, can I, I can I ask Joe something real quick? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I was just gonna say, hey, so Joe, the worst, um, the worst wounds you see, slicing wounds, right? Mm -hmm. Way worse than way worse than than penetration stabbing. I mean, I've seen so many of those, and it's just the um, it's amazing how wide they open up and how much blood is involved when that Absolutely. happens. Especially when it comes to a head or you know somewhere somewhere where you have a lot of vessels, man. I'm I'm telling you that was probably the most amount of blood I've ever seen, and I you know I've seen where you know in one particular incident, my third my third week in the system on the rec yard, uh, Texas Syndicate and Mexican Mafia were at war. And uh, I was out on the rec yard and I've talked, you know, talked about this early on. And uh, inmate walks over with a shank, sticks it in this guy's gut and goes from side to side. And, you know, as yeah. the guy's falling, his intestines are coming out. And, you know, when the guy hits the ground, the other guy, you know, the guy with the weapon walks over, grabs a handful of his guts and throws them up in the concertina wire. Wow. And it just comes yeah. over, calm as a cucumber, drops the weapon and prones out. Yeah, you know that's amazing. You know, you bring up you bring up the Texas Syndicate like that, and it's it's fascinating. The Texas Syndicate actually started in California at Folsom because we had a bunch of Texas inmates, and so they all formed a ring of protection, and then eventually it migrated back to Texas. Yeah, you know, and it's just uh, and you know, so just all of these things, you know, even though even though you know Anthony and I and you and I, even though you know we're we're thousands of miles apart, the commonality is. Yeah, is, yeah. is striking because I, I recognize you know all those all those things you're talking about. Yeah. I, I remember the gang initiations, the buck fifty right across the face, trying yeah. to go for that 150 stitches, and then watching the scar uh, that is left on that individual once um, obviously the the stitches get removed. Now, self injurious behavior. Uh, again, we kind of kept it separate because I think there is a different reaction to that. Now, mind you, even though you know someone could be making the attempt to suicide, you can't say it's suicide. That's a medical term. So we have to utilize self-injurious behavior because uh, you don't know what's in the mindset of that individual. Scary thing about self-injurious behavior is most of the time it could be to get attention. But then if you don't give them attention, they carry it out a little bit more expecting you to protect them. Mind you, I just want people to be careful of that, especially as a rookie. Even though you may think it's superficial because they're trying to manipulate something, whether it's uh, an insanity plea or housing, whatever the case may be, if they don't get your attention, then what happens is they will up the ante and now you need to get to them. Now you need to protect them. I mean, I've seen inmates that are playing the game and trying to hang themselves and staff's like, yeah, well, he kind of does it all the time. And then all of a sudden he catches wind of that and says, well, you don't believe I'm going to do it. And then they really put themselves in a position where they do become dependent on you to save them. For me, what gets to me about self-injurious behavior is um, one, the willingness just to hurt yourself like that I, on the mindset of it all, just to, you know, whatever you're going to do, cut your wrist, bang your head, break your own hand, rip open your scrotum. Uh, I've seen that multiple times with a person with their scrotum in their hand. Um, but the other thing is, if it goes beyond the self-injurious, if it goes to the point where they look like they want to kill themselves, I have seen inmates make the attempt to kill themselves and in the process, relax in that attempt. There's no effort to survive at all. They they somehow they control the uh, automatic response of the body to protect itself and they're fighting the need for them to, uh, you know, uh, pull themselves out of the situation. I, I seen an inmate do something that to me, uh, it really got to me to the point where I had to tell my wife for the first time ever, the specifics of how this person was carrying it out. Like usually I'll tell my mom, I've dealt with a suicide, whatever it is, whether it's immediate or on the management level, uh, overseeing it. Cause then we're going to see the videos. Uh, I, I've had some, obviously, in front of me when I was the officer, even as a sergeant, uh, but I've also uh, successful, some non-successful, but in management, I have uh, witnessed a lot more from a distance, 
Uh, but with that said, there was one on video that really got to me and the guy's willingness to just uh, not make an effort to protect himself when they were going through the process. And for some reason, I couldn't shake it. So I wind up calling my wife why after right after I seen the video. Uh, and, and and the first time ever, I was like, hey, I'm going to tell you something, but I got to get it out. Usually I tell you what happened. I'm going to tell you how this happened. And she just listened. And then I went right back to my work day. So again, you know, uh, self-injurious behavior uh, for me, I don't know if that's harder for me to deal with than a violent attack, uh, but self-injurious behavior uh, for me also definitely weighs uh, uh, on me a lot uh, each time I uh, have to respond to that. So I'll start with Joe first. Joe, what's your thoughts on self-injurious behavior? Yeah, self-injurious behavior kind of delves off into a if, into a different criteria for you know the shock value because you know we don't we don't expect people to harm themselves you know in a prison environment you know our general general consensus is you know people will harm somebody else before they harm themselves you know and we're in a we're in a period now where we have more mental health crisis going on within our jails and prisons than ever before. Um, you know, to see somebody injure themselves, you know, and I'm not talking about the ones that, 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 you know, try to manipulate a situation by nicking their arm with a razor blade, you know, I'm going to cut myself, I'm cutting myself, you know, to, to, to get what they want. You know, I'm talking like, like Anthony said, the full, the ones that go full fledged, you know, uh, ones that, that slice their own necks open, ones that, you know, just slice their own arms open, you know, uh, we've had, you know, inmates with one eye pull their good eye out and eat it. And uh, I mean, it's just, it's, it's the, the shock value of seeing something like that. Um, you know, especially when it comes to, you know, uh, suicide hangings, you know, you know, seeing one in, in, in progress is, is shocking. Um, you know, I don't want to say it's normalized now, but like I said, again, with, with our, our jails and prisons being full, of mental health um you know it's pretty common uh but seeing one that's successful kind of changes the whole gamut uh but yeah i mean you're not really you're not really prepared or or, or taught you know what to think or, or what to do or or you know how to process you know somebody that when you walk up on a cell that's you know slashed their own neck open is pulling veins out or you know uh we have one guy that, that sliced his arm open and, and pulled every vein out of his arm and, you know, and he was holding, holding his own bones. I mean, he, he was just holding on to it like a handlebar. Um, you know, that, they definitely don't prepare you for shit like that, you know, and, yeah. and it, it becomes a question on how do you, how do you deal with it? You know, do you pick up the phone and call a loved one or a homeboy or a buddy and go, man, do you know what the fuck I just seen, you know? Or, you know, is that something that you deal with a week later when you're seeing those images in your mind for whatever reason? Yeah. Um, you know, it, there, there's a lot to process there. Yeah, and, and I, I love what you're saying, though, because at the end of the day, when you see this stuff, it, it's you still have to remember that this is abnormal behavior, even though it's kind of normalized in the prison. Because the last thing you want is to be so desensitized that when you see it out in the real world, you don't have the immediate needed reaction. It's just, oh, that's just someone being stupid. You know, the stuff that we deal with is abnormal, but it happens so routine that it becomes normal to us. And then we have to now go out into the real world and be able to remember that, no, this isn't normal behavior. We just happen to have a bunch of individuals who are more frequent in their committing of the, those extreme behaviors. Russ, what's your thought on self-injurious behavior? Yeah. So, you know, there's a lot to unpack there. I would say that, um, you know, what Joe brought up is the um, most common one, you know, where we see people, you know, uh, whether they're faking or not faking or, you know, trying to get some attention by, you know, uh, scratching their wrist a little bit or something. But, you know, you'll also run across, you know, the the cutters who, you know, they cut themselves, but they're not trying to commit suicide or, or necessarily get attention. They do that. And it's part of a, you know, a whole different, you know, mental mindset. It's the, the, you know, the, the release of pain and they'll try and bandage themselves up. And usually they end up having to be sent to see, you know, somebody in the puzzle house or something. Uh, but you know, there's a whole range. It's not just about suicides and it's not just about some of these graphic things, which I'll get to, I'll get to in a minute, um, that, um, that Joe talked about, 
but you'll see um, it's um, self injurious in a nature, but they'll do it to, you know, to modify or enhance themselves in some bizarre ways. And, you know, we used to have these guys and they would, they would get rocks off the yard and they would, you know, uh, you know, roll them and roll them, and roll them until they were like, you know, little marbles and stuff. And then, you know, they would cut slits in their penis and push those rocks in there and then sew it up with, uh, with dental floss. And, you know, the first time I saw that, I was like, holy shit. And so you end up having to, um, you end up having to, uh, to write those guys up for that self injurious behavior. And, it, and at that point, it's not even necessarily a question about, you know, they're, they're mentally sound to a degree. Um, but they're involved in these things that can, that can kill them through infections and, and things like that. Obviously they can end up costing your uh, institution a whole bunch of money with regards to, uh, medical bills if they do that. And then, uh, and then, you know, on the extreme end of this, you know, uh, Joe talking about, uh, you know, uh, seeing somebody, you know, holding their own bone or, 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 uh, gouging their eye out. Um, I've seen a guy, uh, take. And this takes real determination, take a plastic fork and cut his penis off, um, you know, or uh, or we had one where, you know, the guy like uh, Anthony mentioned, you know, he dug his own nuts out and, you know, they're just flopping around there below that. And, you know, when you're a human being and you see this, I mean, it's 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 shocking and it's mortifying to the point that, you know, it can make you physically ill. And, uh, you know, this is just one of those things where it's like, wow, I go, man, I kind of put all this stuff out of, out of my brain, but, um, you have to be aware, um, especially of the mental health aspect in these things, because these people, they need help and they are a huge liability to, uh, you know, to us, you know, as far as, uh, you know, the kind of lawsuits that we can use, we need to interrupt those things before they go that far, if at all possible. It's not always possible. But anyway, there's uh, some of the graphics on that for you. No, no, that that's spot on. And I just want to move something up. Uh, okay, I want to <laughs> something that Joe said. I'm going to move it up a little bit or a little bit sooner. Um, I, these may kind of connect to each other, but I put medical or mental health crisis, and then we also have dealing with an emotionally unbalanced inmate. Um, I think they kind of bleed in together. Um, so I may have should have just said mental me, me, medical health crisis and then dealing with an emotionally unbalanced inmate. But uh, with that said, I guess we'll start off with the medical side of it all. So let me just uh, let's do this so we can keep the thoughts um, so we can keep the thoughts uh, separate. Let me just go ahead and make this one just medical crisis because this way uh, this way I'll just put medical health crisis. This way, uh, what do you call it? We separate it because I think the one that Joe mentioned could actually stand on its own as well. So medical health crisis, obviously, uh, you're going to deal with that a lot in corrections. I mean, this is the first time, to be honest with you, that a lot of inmates may even get proper medical care, you know, or, or in the same proper mental health care. Uh, having said that, they also know how to take advantage of this because medical is something you cannot joke with. So with that said, you're going to have inmates that... I got chest pains and maybe they don't, but it doesn't matter because you have to be able to uh, determine that. And then most of the time uh, they go to medical, the EKG is normal and they, and they wind up going back. I mean, this is definitely something that inmates know the priority of and inmates will take advantage of it. But having said that, it's the boy that cries wolf here. You cannot um, sit on any of it either, even if you know the person is just doing it you know, just to get his, you know, get what they want. You know, you, you cannot mess around with that. And, and Russ had mentioned before, and uh, I'd like you to go into that a little bit more. Seizures sometimes are hard to prove if they're real or not too, correct? At least in the moment. Um, yeah, well, you, you know, you can, I mean, it depends on what you're out there exactly doing, but some of these guys, you, you get to know, you know, that they're faking it because this is the third or fourth time, you know, and there's nothing like a, you know, nice little capsule of smelling salts and, uh, you know, put it down there. And if they react to that, it's not a seizure. That doesn't mean that you don't have to get the medical help, though. Uh, certainly, you know, you don't want them standing back up. You don't want them doing anything else. But it does prove that it's not that it's not a seizure. 
And uh, I've had some times where, you know, after you do that once, they're, they're really not game for, for that anymore. Uh, but, you know, there's a whole gambit to all this medical stuff we do. You know, uh, when I came on, uh, we were having lots of inmates uh, die from uh, AIDS, you know, back in the day. And so, uh, you know, it's something it's distressing, um, I think, to your psyche, uh, you know, when you're there at the hospital and the third day in the road, uh, a row, the guy that you're there to watch, you know, uh, finally dies from AIDS after a long illness, you know, and I'll I'll never forget that. I think I think it was three days in a row that um, that I was out there and watching someone or being part of our uh, part of our, our hospital shift that we had there. And an inmate, you know, just dies. And so that's the kind of thing when you watch people die repeatedly, it, it can definitely affect you. Uh, but there's, there's, you know, so many more things that we see. And it's not just about the things that are faked, but, you know, um, you know, guys going into diabetic comas, people suffering heart attacks. Um, you know, you've got staff out there, uh, you know, doing chest compressions on people that have, that have had heart attacks. And just uh, too many things for me to even uh, remember here. But, you know, I remember I had one of my, uh, I think it was one of my, I can't remember if he was a clerk or if he was just a guy that was like down on the one end of our uh, thing, but he had spent time at a, um, at a prison down in the Valley and he had contracted Valley fever and it killed him, you know? And so, but you get, you get to know these guys and it's just like, damn, you know, he was just fine the other day and then he got sick and died. And so you get to see this repeatedly because the inmate population, um, although some of them uh, do work out and I mean, and they're really intense people and, and, you know, they're building muscle and stuff. There's a aspect of them that are really uh, not well because they've been doing methamphetamine for uh, 20 or 30 years, uh, you know, or slamming heroin um, and all of these other things. Uh, a lot of them have uh, hepatitis C. And so uh, there's a lot of them that are sick. And so if you're in this profession, be prepared. You're going to see people die. Oof. And then I, I want to mention something, too. I, I think the so this is more of the human connection to it all, inmate or not. It just shows you how fragile human life could be. I mean, you can have a guy that works next to you, like an inmate, uh, porter, whatever it is. And then a couple of weeks later, uh, you know, <laughs> they, they become sick and wither away. And we saw it in COVID. COVID, the amount of inmates that died in a brief, small window was extremely rapid. And these were people that were up and running around uh, not not so many weeks you know, prior. And now look at them. I mean, yes, like Russ mentioned, a lot of them did have underlying concerns, but they weren't surfaced. You know? And now all of a sudden COVID comes in and all of these medical things just start coming out and it's like, holy crap. And then I think for me, when it comes to having to deal with those medical crises, it's just showing you like how many different ways people could die, you know, just so many different ways that, you know, the silent thing that could be totally creeping up on you, you know, a guy that's perfectly healthy and then uh, 42 has a heart attack and, you know, you, you can't do anything about it. And, and then obviously you get those that do die of overdoses and careless behavior. And to be honest with you, uh, not that I want to see that, um, but I could remove myself a little bit from that as I'm, you know, going through the emotions because I've seen so many of that. Plus, I, I can't relate to that. Uh, sad, uh, I, don't, I think it's a good thing. I, I'm never been a drug addict, uh, nor am I planning on being a drug addict. I'm not saying it can't happen, but I'm not planning to be one. So therefore, if I do have someone that dies of a drug overdose, uh, there's no immediate relationship to that cause for me. I can immediately separate myself from that. But then you get a guy that's in his 40s dying of a heart attack or a guy that got cancer that you're watching wither away. That may be harder for me to uh, deal with or comprehend because those could be things that I can't cannot control that could happen to me. And then having to watch this person wither away, regardless of they're an inmate or not, you kind of look at you look inwards like, holy shit, that could happen to me. Like, I mean, literally, that could be me. So, again, um, I, it, it's hard to remove yourself from some of the things that could connect you on the human element side, uh, but you have to, and then you got to move forward with it because uh, you have a job to do. Uh, what's your thoughts on that, Joe, when it comes to the medical health crisis? Yeah, you know, especially when it involves, you know, deaths, you know, we're, 
in, in our own personal ways, you know, whether it be a loved one or, or, you know, somebody we lost to cancer or heart disease or, you know, stuff like that. We're kind of, we're kind of a little, a little more better prepared um, to handle that aspect of, of death when it does happen. Um, you know, uh, inmates, when it comes to their, their careless behaviors prior to their incarcerations, you know, and if you know their history, you know, when something happens, if they, you know, they die from hepatitis or they, they die from uh, being a bad diabetic that's non-compliant with his meds and, and what he eats, uh, ones that die from cancer or whatever the disease is, you know, you kind of normalize that, you know, in the thought process because you're like, okay, well, you know, he, he, he did, he did all this prior to his, you know, incarceration. So it's kind of expected. Um, you know, the sudden deaths, you know, such as heart attacks and heart failures and, uh, you know, things of that nature, you know, it, it's, it, it's, it's shocking to the psyche, um, when you don't expect it. Um, but again, it's, it's something that, that most of us tend to normalize later on down the road because, you know, it, it's, you know, we face it, we're in a prison. Most of these guys are serving life sentences or not getting out, um, uh, you know, so, you, you, you tend to process a little process it a little bit differently from, you know, your everyday, say, family, immediate family member death. Um, you know, the ones that, that the ones that like Russ said that do get you or, you know, or even, you know, hell, COVID. We'll take COVID, for example. You know, one of my one of my sergeants died from COVID and I talked to him three days before on the phone and uh, he thought he just had an upper respiratory infection. And uh, was telling me he, you know, he was going to take a few days, get some shots, and he'd be back at work Monday. Um, and I get that call Friday that he passed away in the hospital from COVID. You know, yeah. You know, it's just one of the things that you know it, it, when they when they're sudden like that, they shock you. Um, you know, and it's it's as sad as it is to say, it's it's part of the everyday life in the, in the prison environment. You know, not everybody can live forever, inside or outside. You know, we're going to go one way or the other. When that man upstairs says it's time to go, it's time to go. Yeah, when you're in the first responder profession, because uh, this doesn't just affect just corrections, but other first responders, uh, death, uh, you could be surrounded by, you could be surrounded by death more frequently. And when you, when you have a death, the first thing that you do is you compare yourself to the outcome. Uh, you try to remove yourself from the outcome. Doesn't mean I, I don't disconnect from the person, but my initial question may be, well, what did they die of? And it's not really always for a sympathetic ear. It's, kind of me measuring how close I am to death. You know, yeah. that's why the question is being asked. So now when you have, you know, you could do that, you know, when, when the deaths are rare, uh, but when they're just coming after you, you know, coming one after the other, one after the other, one after the other, it becomes harder to separate, you know, yourself from all these different things. And then you wind up getting people that, uh, you know, they come home and, and they could be a little bit more, Paranoid, uh, paranoid, because again, there's just so many deaths that are, could be happening one right after the other that you can't just disconnect from that. So I want people to know that is part of the human experience is when you see someone that's passed, not to be cold, but you do ask what they may have died from. And it's mostly probably because you want to make sure that, you know, you're not going to die from that, or you want to have that initial separation from it. And, and it's, Human behavior is not a bad thing. It's a human behavior. You know, sometimes you see like uh, you go to services and, you you know, let's say it's an older person that passed and it's like, well, they were old, you know, was, and we make it sound like we're just, you know, comforting everyone. But it's really a self-comfort, too, because maybe we're not old yet. And then when you become old, it becomes more about what they had. Oh, they were a smoker their whole life. Yeah, but they lived to 97 years old. You know what I mean? You know, I mean, but they, people will try to find a reason behind it so they could immediately separate themselves from the outcome of what the, uh, of, of, of what caused the death, uh, which is normal. But now imagine being in a prison, just being a first responder and just being overwhelmed with it. Eventually you run out of ways to justify it. And by the way, I, I'm not saying validate. I'm saying justify justifies the internal. It's how you see it. Uh, it doesn't mean it's correct. It's just how you see it. So you can move forward. Um, all right. So now, Let's go with dealing with the emotionally unbalanced inmate. I was going to go with Joe on this first and then Russ because Joe had brought this one up. So, Joe, you got any stories you'd like to share here and any advice? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I, I, kind of going back to the guy that, 
that cut his arm open was was uh you know pulling all his veins out of his arm and and using his the bones in his arm as a as a motorcycle throttle um you know it, it, there there are things in 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 the prison and jail environment that you know there's there's no amount of training that will prepare you for what you're going to see when you're dealing with an emotionally unbalanced inmate especially one that has been unbalanced for so long that's received no kind of uh mental health support or mental health diagnostics um, you know, a lot of these guys don't feel pain. Um, and it's hard to understand how, how can, how can a human body not feel pain? Um, when you're, when you're self inflicting injuries on yourself, you know, uh, it doesn't take much for me to feel pain, especially at the age of 52. Um, but it's, it's, it's shocking to the person, you know, when you walk up and you see, uh, uh, an unbalanced inmate emotionally causing injuries to himself that, you know, are so horrifying, you know, you're not even thinking about the injury anymore. You're thinking, how in the hell is this guy not feeling this? Cause you know, the whole time this guy's got his bones in his hand and he's, he's doing this number. He's laughing. He's joking. I'm thinking, holy shit, you know, how in the hell is this guy not feeling this? You know, this that's one of the things that, you know, I, I think that we should be doing better training on um, in the academies um, and also at the unit levels, you know, to get people better prepared in dealing with an unbalanced inmate. Sometimes you can kind of talk them off the fence from from self-injury. And sometimes they got it so hell bent on their mind that they're going to do it because, you know, um, I can't get the voices to leave me. So I'm going to cut the voices out. Um, I can't get the voices to leave me. So I'm, 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 I'm going to choke myself out until they go away. Um, it's, it's, it's a different ball game when you're dealing with an unbalanced, emotionally unbalanced inmate, because you really don't know what the right Avenue is in order to try to, reason with this unbalanced inmate and it, it it proves to be a tough feat for any person not just you know supervision but you know for the frontline staff because you know this guy's cutting himself open in a cell you know other than hauling for for medical and, and supervision and a video camera what do i do you know and that's something that you know after a while can kind of torment you a little bit, you know, especially when, when the, when the injuries are so horrendous to themselves that, you know, it, it, that can kind of leave a lasting impression on you. Yeah. I want to mention something too. Uh, obviously you have inmates that uh, may always, uh, be emotionally unbalanced and hopefully they're being under the care of our mental health direct, uh, maybe like in a therapeutic community. Uh, but then you have some that just the situation gets the best of them. And uh, that could be someone that you deal with on a regular basis. And all of a sudden something happens, whether it's at home, which we may not know about because families sometimes talk to them directly without letting us know, or, you know, just something in the moment. And next thing we, we know is we're trying to talk to this individual to try to calm them down. But the situation has just put so much pressure. And one of the things I've realized when it comes to trying to deescalate is I try to determine what the cause is. Because I think, to be honest with you, once I know what the cause is, I can kind of figure out if I'm going to be successful or not. I mean, it's that simple. And that will kind of tell me how much time I'm willing to invest in something. I don't want to put hope into a situation that I cannot control, but rather I want to put it into the person. So if I find out what's the cause of it, uh, then what I do is I do try to de-escalate to some extent to still get things from point A to point B. But I think the problem is with some people... Uh, when it comes to dealing with an emotionally unbalanced inmate, and I think this is really good advice to people if they want to hear me out on this. When you look to de-escalate, uh, you're basically looking to de-escalate by uh, getting someone to go from one point to the other. Thank you, babe. My wife made me soup and she brought it down. So thank you, beautiful. Aw, that was nice. It's pasta visual. But guys, when you look to de-escalate, remember the effort to de-escalate is to go get them from point A to point B. It's not always going to be to resolve what they're dealing with. It's going to be, I got to get this person moving. 
I know some people that don't know how to separate the two and they wind up over investment in time because they're looking to resolve it. When I'm just saying, Hey, you had so many chances now to move the person. Uh, you're choosing not to. It's like, well, I'm still, no, no, no. I, 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 I want to basically tell you that you're not there to resolve it. You're not going to be able to resolve it. You're there to help me get that person from point A to point B. That is the operational resolution. So I think when you go to de-escalate, you're dealing with an emotionally unbalanced inmate. You do have your professionals that will deal with the individual. Our job is to kind of deal with the operation side. And I think when you start to mix it, you wind up putting too much effort into the individual uh, when, when at this point I'm trying to motivate operations. If that makes any sense, uh, what's your thoughts on that, Russ? Because there's a lot there, I think. Yeah, you know, I think the the main thing is is you know, um, as a as a corrections professional, when you're trying to deal with these people, know that you're going to basically have two types. You're going to have those that have some type of chronic and long term um, mental illness, and then some that are going to have an acute mental illness, which is often precipitated by something happening to them, um, the loss of a loved one, um, being attacked. Um, you know, uh, in prison, being raped in prison, um, or 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 things of that nature. Um, you know, when I think about you know those with the uh, you know the chronic, acute, long term illnesses, uh, I'll never forget. You know, we had this uh, one inmate in in the section I was in where we used to have actual bars. Um, you know, for the for the cells for for all of it, and uh, you know, he had taken some plastic and some blankets and uh, put it up against the bars so that he could flood his cell. And there was about two and a half feet of water in there. And I come by and I'm just looking at him and he is in there with his, um, you know, feet wrapped around the toilet doing sit-ups in this water, you know, and then he sits up and he reaches over and uh, takes a turd and pops it in his mouth. And, uh, you know, how do you react to something like that? that there's, there's no kind of treatment that can fix that all all that mental health can do is manage that type of illness with with really truly heavy drugs um the ones where you're actually able to reason with people are probably those that are in an acute crisis um that you that actually you know still have some level of uh you know being able to communicate back and forth with um but that's going to run the whole gamut the the things that people do uh that they lash out they become self-injurious um, they may try and do a uh, suicide by cop, which in a lot of cases, because we don't necessarily have guns readily available, uh, they might have to really commit to a much more severe action than they would out there on the street. But we, but we see that too. So, uh, you know, lots of, uh, lots of, uh, make, uh, self-preservation first and foremost when you're, when you're dealing with them, but know that you are going to see some, some crazy shit. Right. And if I may say something, if they're willing to do it to themselves, you know, they're willing to do it to others. And I want to also mention something for some people that say, oh, the guy that was eating shit is just playing a game. That's a unique game. No. playing. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like that some is- people will say, oh, it's like, no, that's not a game. Uh, regardless if they may uh, say that the guy's just playing the mental health route. The point is that they're still willing to do it, which makes yeah. it to me not a game. And, uh, and this agree. guy w- would have had he would have had motivation because he was because he was and is um, still on on death row. But uh, but, you know, in order in order to take lives in the way that he took them, let's just put it this way is, yes, he is uh, mentally sick and twisted. I wind up muting because I'm hoping people didn't hear me chewing and eating on the other side. Um, <laughs> yes. Yeah, so, yeah. So and, and now. Uh, the next spot touches into mind games. I actually wrote a whole book on inmate manipulation. Uh, you got to be weary uh, that inmates will try to play games to gain favor. Uh, we, we we have so many videos on specifics behind certain games being played. So this dialogue doesn't have to go deep into that, but just be wary of it. Be prepared. And universal precaution does not mean you don't talk to inmates. It means be wary when you do. Uh, but with that said, guys, uh, this is something that we need to be more aware of. You you, you don't want to try to outsmart or outmaneuver uh, an expert manipulator. Your goal is to avoid it, not to engage and win. I know a lot of people would be like, oh, well, if they tried that, I'm going to do this, this. That's not the purpose. This is not a game that you want to be playing at any level. 
you just want to be to you know you just want to be avoiding it. Uh, with that said, sometimes that no, that that no that comes from you could help that. Uh, but with that said, be wary of of the mind games. It could happen at any time, and if you don't believe it could happen, is when it does happen. That's all I'm saying. I've seen people literally in the process of being manipulated, and they think they're winning it the whole time. And they are so far behind the eight ball because the inmates are already playing chess. They predicted these moves. So you're just going along with what they expected. So with that said, the best way to do it and deal with the mind games is the moment you sense something, you nip it. You don't engage. You don't look to win. Uh, you sure as hell don't want to lose. So you avoid playing the game to begin with. The best way you can avoid a mind game, the best way you don't lose from a mind game is to not play it at all. Why am I going to uh, gamble money that I don't have uh, when I could just step away and not even play the table? Uh, what's your thoughts on that, Joe, when it comes to the mind games? Yeah, I mean, you got to, you got to, you know, and that's everyday life. Not everybody's, not everybody's, you know, sincere with their intents, you know. Uh, you know, everybody, everybody has the capacity for playing mind games, you know, Um whether it's through, you know, your, your kids, your spouse, work, um, you know, you know, look at, look at Anthony. He's, he's over there eating a, a bowl full of pasta for Jules, um, unknown that uh, he fell for the okie doke. His wife laced it with laxatives because, uh, <laughs> you know, he fell for the biggest mind game of them all. Love you, honey. That's going to end the show pretty quick. <laughs> but yeah just be cognizant you know be cognizant of the mind games not everybody is not everybody's intense or, or sincere you know everybody everybody has that angle for for some sort of manipulation um and, and if they can get away with it especially in a prison environment they they definitely will will try it and what's your thoughts on this russ I'm sure have you seen it yeah um you know when you're out there and you're amongst the inmate population it's hard for some people to understand that they are being manipulated, you know, to small degrees and even to some large degrees. You know, I, there is probably not a week goes by that I'm not uh, discussing, you know, some type of manipulation. And I will have an officer say, well, no one can manipulate me because I would never risk my career and my wife and my dog and my house on that. And they're oblivious to the fact that, they're still being manipulated just because they're not corruptible does not mean they're not manipulatable because we as humans have, you know, a predisposition toward that. Now, some people are better at resisting it than others, but if you're so blind to the fact that you think you can't be manipulated, you're probably actually one of the ones um, that it's more that way. You know, I've, I've told the story before about uh, my clerk and how we were getting ready to do a mass search and, you know, he kind of approached me and said, hey, I, I got a little bit uh, extra in my area. And I was like, OK, you know, whatever. And then I, I got thinking about that. I said, you know, that uh, having a little bit extra is not that big of a deal. Why was it that he approached me, you know? And by the time everything was said and done, um, one of my officers had found uh, a DVD player and uh, a whole bunch of uh, porn on DVD discs. And then it was like, well, hmm, how did he get all of this stuff in here? And then that turned into finding love letters, uh, love letters to a nurse that was uh, working in uh, medical. And so, uh, yeah, I think I think it was a nurse. I can't remember if it was a nurse or a teacher. And then that turned into uh, some fraud that they were pulling in the in the local town next to where we were. And then um, at the end of it all, when we rolled him up because of because of uh, the investigation that, that we were going to have to do, um, unfortunately, the officer that had uh, done the search had not quite been as thorough as I hoped. And that was the very first uh, cell phone that started ringing in the uh, in the property. The very first one ever found at that facility. So. I mean, uh, there's a lot to unpack there. You know, this guy was definitely a master manipulator and he had all kinds of, uh, you know, fraud things going on in the, in the local towns and uh, deeds and real estate deals and just crazy stuff. And, uh, and he was, and even though his was the first phone that was trafficked in there, he had trafficked apparently up to that uh, point about $80,000 worth of phones, which is probably 
not that many in prison. That's probably, you know, 12, 13 phones, something like that. So, uh, you know, you should be aware that the instant you walk in those gates, whatever else you see, you are seeing manipulation going on from that point forward. Whether you can recognize it or not is another story. But, you know, one of the great things is, is man, get some training, you know, right here on Tier Talk. We do this a lot. Ah. I mean, I mean, the key here, guys, even with dialogue, uh, you know, you always should have control. Uh, you don't want to wind up on the back end of answering all questions. You Control really comes from the person who asks the questions. Um, and I, I will say, uh, for me, I, I kind of made this uh, my passion. That's why I wrote that book, because um, I've seen it happen. I have been shocked by people that have been caught up. Uh, and then I kind of look back wondering if we could have done something different. But the problem is... It wasn't up. To, it really wasn't up to us to recognize. It's up to the person who's being manipulated first to recognize, because all we see is the outward behavior shift. But to be honest with you, if you have control of that, you need to recognize the internal mindset changing. So that's why when it comes to preparing yourself for the games that people play, the best person that could prepare you is you, because the first shift an inmate does is that mindset which you should recognize. There should be some level of conflict that um, you cannot settle. And when that happens, you need to address that immediately and say, hey, something doesn't feel right. Uh, so at this point here, um, whatever you're trying to do, it comes to a stop. And I'd rather be wrong and have this situation be socially awkward than to be right and be worried about it being socially awkward. You know, uh, I, 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 that's another thing that we teach. Now... Uh, we're going to go to escape or escape attempts. I'm going to get Russ on. We lost Russ for a second, but he's coming back. Uh, this is something to me is the biggest embarrassment uh, when it comes to working in a correctional facility. Cause don't get me wrong. Uh, you don't want a death to happen. You don't want a suicide. There's so many extremes. Uh, but if I could personally say to me, what is the biggest embarrassment? Uh, and I'm saying embarrassment. I, I didn't, I, you know, just just in my perspective, it's going to be an escape only because one, the level of trust that we have to hold people in. But having said that, when there is an escape, or there uh, is a pretty valid escape attempt, let's just do that because you could have many attempts. It's just a matter of how far they go. So let's go for an escape or a pretty valid escape attempt. That's a systematic failure. Uh, there's no if and buts about it because there are so many things in play, so many layers of safety and security that must get violated uh, in order for a person to make it that far or, or, or make it close to escaping. So with that said, when you have an escape, the first thing you have to look at are the systems that are in play, which most likely could be a complacent and uh, negligent workplace culture, which then goes back to saying, well, how long has it been that way? You know, because most of the time when we have escapes or escape attempts, when you have all these layers that are meant uh, as protection, if someone's able to do it, that means they found a hole in every layer. I mean, think about how crazy that is. I mean, facilities are built on fail safes and to break every layer, that's extremely, extremely embarrassing. Uh, what's your thoughts on that, Joe? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's, that's the ultimate loss. You know, what is our main goal? Our main goal is to keep them in the fence. You know, when, when an escape, a successful escape happens, you know, it's 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 really at that point, it's not just one person's job. Yeah, one person primarily contributed to it, but, you know, it, it's a layer of it's a layer of failures, whether it be classification, whether it be educational, whether it be, you know, um, housing. You know, we we place this individual in a position where he could beat us at our own game and 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 win big, uh, you know, escapes. And I agree that it's the ultimate embarrassment because, you know, our main job function is to keep them in the fence, to provide public safety by keeping them in the fence. You know, that's our main, main goal. And when escape, you know, escapes do happen, you know, it, it it's it's. It's usually because, you know, there's layers of complacency there. There's layers of, of job failures there. You know, we didn't do our searches, you know, uh, it, had we done our, had we done our, our cell searches like we were supposed to, we might've found this map that this guy had for six weeks, you know, um, 
prior to his escape. You know, we might have found the 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 items that he stole from medical. Uh, you know, when he went for his medical appointment, we failed to pat search him on the way back to his dorm. Uh, you know, it, 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 you know, it could be, you know, we, we classified him wrong. We put him in, we put him in a dorm only environment when he should have been in a cell block environment. Uh, you know, there's, there's just a multitude of things that can, that can go wrong during an escape or an escape attempt. And, you know, it's, it's something that we all have to look within our own departments to make sure, are we doing this correctly? Or, or, you know, are our processes in place? You know, we know our process is in place. The big question is, are people doing what they're supposed to do? And, you know, when that, when, when, when an escape happens, there's a failure somewhere. Yes. And, and Russ may have to step back. He may come back on. I don't know if he's having an internet connection, um, but either way, we'll keep going. I, I let him know. He's going to try to see if he can come back on. Okay. Um, so, uh, Russ, uh, if, if it is an internet connection, uh, no stress, but if it's a family concern, uh, no worries. Obviously, uh, we're here for you if you need it. Um, so let's go with false allegations. Uh, you see a lot of that with Priya now, but just in, yeah, you know, just in general, uh, you're going to get it. Um, you know, inmates will see an advantage of making a false allegation. And usually some of these false allegations are usually an inmate's effort to, gain control. I mean, you'll see a lot of it through the grievance system. You know, your effort to search is retaliatory or, you know, your pat frisk was unprofessional. I'm calling Priya. I mean, again, whatever the specific allegation would be, usually that allegation is an effort to gain some level of control and intimidate uh, even higher level management. Because what they'll do is they'll say, well, the officer's retaliating against me. And then your effort now is to see if that's true. Most likely it's not. The officer's doing their job. And then the and they go, well, I'm going to get my lawyer. Okay, well, I'm going to back my officer. You know, the, usually the false allegations are meant to intimidate and stop whatever progress you're making. Uh, so with that said, you know, it's something that you are going to deal with. I wouldn't take it personal, but I want to add something else to that. I also would not take the investigation of that false allegation personal. The false allegation may still have to be investigated because of the seriousness of it all. Uh, but having said that, uh, it's not an investigation out of judgment, but rather out of curiosity. So know for a fact, sometimes we have to go through the motions, but don't take it seriously because even I've been under investigation for false allegations. I know what the procedure is. The investigation really is to uh, eliminate liability. Uh, so with that said, my advice for you on this one is be prepared for it, uh, but on a greater mindset, be prepared to be investigated for it. Uh, what's your what's your thoughts on all that, Joe? Because there's a lot there too. Yeah, absolutely. You know, anybody anybody who has any tenure or, or, or plans on having any tenure with this job is going to be the subject of, of false allegations, whether it be you know like like Andy said, where where it's either a pre issue or or you know some sort of issue. You know, I, officers get grieved on all the time because they may may just want a new radio and he decided to damage his own radio and then say that the officer did it during his cell search. So he doesn't have to pay for it. You know, we're going to be we're going to be the victims of false allegations, you know, through our career multiple times. Um, it's not something that we need to freak out about. You know, I've had officers that got their first grievance and come just sweating bullets. Holy shit. This dude just grieved me because I, I took his T-shirt. OK, why did you take his T-shirt? Well, because he didn't have his name and number written on it. OK, so you're legit. So don't worry about it. It's not a, it, it's not a big deal. You know, um, even if you find that, you know, it, it, and, and pre allegations are the worst. Oh, my God. You know, they, they have to send them to, to some sort of internal affairs department or for us, what they call officer inspector general, you know, for investigation. And they basically look at the totality of the investigation from the PREA and, you know, determine whether it's legit or not legit. And, and, and a lot of times it's not legit because, you know. Uh, the way the investigation was completed uh, by the administration prior to being forwarded out, um, you know, and you're going to be investigated for that too. And the main thing is, you know, if, if you're not doing anything wrong, you're abiding my policy, you're doing your job, you're firm, fair, and consistent, you know, you're going to be the, you're going to be the subject of some sort of false allegation. As long as you're doing what you're supposed to do, don't, don't worry about it. Don't flip out. Because if you're doing what you're supposed to do, trust me, I'm going to have your back all day long. Mm -hmm. you know? and, 
And, and Joe, you're, you're spot on because sometimes even those allegations, the inmate just is trying to push for a, 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 you know, a, a lawsuit. So they don't even want the matter settled. They just want to document it. And the moment that you react and settle the concern and find it to be false, uh, whatever it is that they're trying to trump up, that documentation or whatever they're trying to build, it only takes one good, effective turnaround on our end that can negate a whole chain full of stuff that that inmate's trying to build up. Now, Russ, first of all, I, I want to mention, is everything okay? Because I kind of, uh, everything's good? Yeah, every, everything everything's good. I'll, I'll, I'll talk to you about it in a minute. All right, you had us a bit concerned. And then, okay, so I, it's up to you, Russ. We did, we did just get done with false allegations, but we also did escape and escape attempts. Would you like to give your insight on both? Uh, yeah, you know, uh, escape attempts are uh, something that we have to take very seriously uh, because, you know, the things that we're apt to see in regards to those escapes, you know, um, especially when we're talking about, you know, escape by force or escape by the, the, the threat of force, um, you know, these are things that, um, you know, often happen in ways that end up costing uh, correctional officers um, across the nation uh, their lives, you know, because these guys, there's a high stakes gambit in order to try and pull off what is a very hard thing to do. Um, you know, the other thing, you know, I've been in on uh, not just escapes, but, um, you know, escape pursuit details where, you know, you're going to be out there uh, by yourself or maybe not necessarily by yourself, but, you know, hopefully with at least one partner, you know, in conditions where, you know, it's it's cold, um, you know, it's going on all night long. And, uh, you know, all you've got is uh, all you've got is your patrol car and, uh, you know, a couple of shotguns. And, uh, you know, you're running around trying to find this guy and it's, it can be, uh, it can be, you know, very daunting, you know, because you're out there, um, you know, putting yourself in danger, you know, for the, for the public's sake. Uh, and then, you know, we, we've, we've had some, uh, we've had some serious things happen, um, recently here in California. Um, anytime someone's willing to, to try and escape, um, you know, they're, they're willing to, they're generally willing to kill you over it. Um, you know, we have, uh, we have things going on out here in California where they will just send any inmate at any time, even those with life sentences, you know, out to, uh, you know, really, uh, kind of, I don't know, what's the word for it, to medical appointments that are of an elect, uh, you know, and, um, you know, it's an electoral procedure. It's not something that's necessary. And, you know, we had an inmate try and escape uh, from one of those details uh, recently. We had an inmate um, that managed to get into uh, one of our uh, control booths and uh, and uh, sexually assaulted the officer up there. And that was an escape attempt. And uh, so these things go on and on. And so just, you know, know that as these things happen, as these things uh, occur, uh, we are the ones that stand between the public and these animals, these vicious, you know, truly uh, violent people. And, uh, you know, hopefully uh, each and every time we're able to stop that, but it's not always the case. Right, Russell. What about the false allegation aspect? So on the false allegation aspect, you know, when I look at that is, is that's something you, what you should do is you should be proactive in placing yourself in a position that it's always going to be hard for them um, to prove anything against you. The number one thing that you do is you don't do things that get you in trouble. But number two is, is, you know, get in on the documentation, uh, make sure that um, make sure that you're doing, you know, everything that you can do to address what the situation is. If you knew about it ahead of time. And then lastly, and this is something that I believe is going to start happening more as we see it across this nature is these things uh, across this nation is that as these things uh, get investigated and they come back and, you know, there's no evidence or there's actually, you know, um, evidence to the contrary, um, I'm hoping that, you know, we're going to start seeing civil suits um, by correctional officers that are going to say, hey, this is wrong. You can't just do this. And I know that and I know that, you know, the government entities and agencies are not for that. They're not doing anything to help at this time. But the problem is, is there's nothing holding inmates accountable for all of these specious allegations. And I believe that that's going to be the next big thing on the horizon. You can flag this tape right now. And 
Yeah, I, I, I agree with you, Russ, 100%. I, I believe that's something that we have to do as an agency. Now, this is a good one here, uh, being overwhelmed. Uh, let's be honest, guys. This does happen a lot. It, it, it does happen a lot. Uh, you're entering in corrections right now. Obviously, uh, you're dealing with so many different situations that could be unfolding on once. Uh, sometimes you don't get a chance to breathe in between incidences. Um, you have staff right now that have to work tremendous amount of hours. I mean, everything that comes at you in corrections can come at you unforgivingly, you know, and again, it, it's, it's not so much, as I said, being ready for it, but being prepared that all because one moment ends, doesn't mean you're going to have a chance to breathe before you go into the next one. Uh, to be honest with you, uh, there's so many ways that you could be overwhelmed in corrections, because we'll get into bad management as well shortly. But um, the, the problem here is most of the time when you're feeling overwhelmed, if you look to solve the matter, you'll realize that the situation itself that's causing it at this point cannot be solved. It's just something that we're going through, like the understaffing issue. We're trying, we're trying. But at this point, it, I, I don't see it being solved in the very near future. So having said that, sometimes the mindset of knowing it's something that you have to face every day, it's something that you have to deal with every day, um, it can help you as opposed to just kind of just uh, allowing it to affect you in a way that's negative. I mean, this is really about your own attitudes and efforts. And is this easier said than done? A hundred percent, it's easier said than done. A hundred percent, it's easier said than done. Um, but with that said, for your own mental well-being, uh, and this is just my opinion, how you choose to look at these concerns when you're being forced. And then if you're a family uh, on the outside looking in, you know, understand that your loved one is a bit overwhelmed because some of the concerns that a lot of our officers face is that they feel guilty over a concern they cannot control. I feel guilty that I'm, I'm going to be mandated again. Now I got to tell my family and then the family holds that person um, fully accountable is that it's their choice to be held. And I think that adds to the burden of being overwhelmed. So I, I, I think the point here is that if we all have a support system in which we alleviate guilt, guilt, especially if it comes from things that you cannot control, that can go a long way. Like if, if I get mandated, my biggest thing is having to tell my wife, I got mandated. Now, if my wife on the other end says, I get it, and she's able to maneuver to make sure things are taken care of, I don't have feelings of guilt and other things that I, I unfortunately can't do anything about. Uh, but having said that, a good support system will help you go through it. But being overwhelmed is something that you should expect. And uh, I guess I, I don't mean to sound rude, uh, but you're going to have to deal with it. Uh, there's just no other way if and buts about it. This is a first responder profession. We are essential in what we do. And at this point, you know, when you take the job, there are going to be commitments and expectations, which could include, uh, you know, just the overburden of uh, needed responsibilities. Uh, and again, I wish I could sugarcoat it better. Uh, but having said that, it's a, it's a concern that I don't think is going to change anytime soon. So uh, the only thing I can tell you right now is, kind of, you got to deal with it until we can figure this all out. Uh, what's your thoughts on that, uh, Russ? Um, yeah, it's, it's real easy to, to feel overwhelmed. You know, the things uh, that come at you, you know, um, you have to make decisions quickly. Um, you can't hesitate. Um, you know, you're often, you know, uh, put into that position where, you know, you just feel like you're going through the wash over and over and over again. Um, it's, you know, especially as you're cycling back in and out of mandatory overtimes and, uh, and you know what, this is, this is not a profession for the faint of heart. Um, the good thing that I will say about that is, is, uh, we're becoming, you know, more cognizant of, you know, employee wellness and the things that we can do, uh, to help ourselves, the things that we can do to help others. Um, I think that, you know, um, there's a long path ahead. Uh, but you know what, um, you can take, um, you know, you can take, uh, some real help from your fellow brothers and sisters, you know, um, uh, I mean, uh, not every facility is the same, of course, but just know that, you know, there, there are people that you can rely on and that, um, and that are going to be there to help you, to back you up with regards to advice. There's no better place to get that than, 
than pure talk and, and keepers of chaos. Uh, and so there are things that you can do, you know, there are coping mechanisms, um, that you can use, you know, um, my coping mechanism today, even though I'm not, you know, involved in the, the badge part of the system, you know, is, uh, you know, just hanging out here and shooting the bull with you guys and, you know, working out down at the gym and so forth. So just know that there are coping mechanisms and you should, you should explore those. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. And as I said, guys, wellness is a big initiative right now, but it is intentional on your efforts to know that there's a concern and then work on how you can address that concern. What's your thoughts on being overwhelmed, Joe? Man, it is very easy in this profession to be overwhelmed, um, especially when you got a lot going on in your personal life, um, your professional life. You know, it's 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 a hard thing to endure, um, you know, dealing with the guilt of the choice you make, whether it's work or family, um, you know, cause I've been on both sides of that gamut, you know, um, dealing with sick family members, um, uh, deteriorating from either cancer or dementia, you know, you're, you take that time from work and you feel guilty because you're not there, you know, especially as me as a Lieutenant, you know, cause you know, for me, it was always lead by example. So I always wanted to be there, but at the same time you choose, if you choose work, then you're losing out on valuable time with that family member and you're juggling, you're juggling personal life, professional life. Um, you're juggling choices that you're having to make. You're juggling, you know, there's, there's a lot to, there's, there's a lot there to get easily overwhelmed in this profession. And, you know, sometimes you just got to hit the brakes and take a day for yourself. I learned that the hard way because, you know, I've, I've, I've run into a wall several times, um, dealing with being overwhelmed in, in, in the profession, not just as a, you know, as a Lieutenant, but also as a CO, you know, I spent the better, better part of my time driving back and forth, you know, four hours one way to get back home to help, you know, my mother who was deteriorating from dementia, you know, trying to alleviate pressure on my family members from having to, you know, take care of her solely all the time. Um, you know, and, and sometimes it, it can lead to a massive burnout, you know, and, and you've got to be able to, realize where you are mentally and know that you're fixing to hit that wall. You're fixing to be totally overwhelmed and hit that wall. And at some point you have to, you have to hit the brakes and, you know, you have to take care of yourself. You get to give yourself that, that day break or, or maybe even a weekend break, because, you know, if, if you burn yourself out and you overwhelm yourself to the point where you just crack, you know, you're not going to be any good to your coworkers. You're not going to be any good to your family members. You know, it's it's very, very easy. It's it, this profession is is not for the faint hearted. Um, you know, we we me as a supervisor, I don't, I don't want to say we as a as a whole um, have high expectations of, of dedication, loyalty. And, and if you're scheduled to be there, we want you there. Um, you know, I know things happen and I know that there are days where you got to have that time. But, you know, putting pressures on yourself professionally is worse than any pressure that anybody in your supervisory chain can put on you, because sometimes we are our own worst critics. And yeah. those those feelings of guilt don't don't come because of, of something that somebody else said to you or something that somebody else did. It's 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 your own. It's your own mind that causes that guilt. And you got to learn to recognize that sign um, when it happens and, and take that time for yourself. I agree. And then, guys, this also crosses into peer support. Uh, you are going to play an active role in being a peer support. So be ready to deal with that. You're going to have a lot of officers that have or a lot of staff members that have demons that they're fighting. And uh, unfortunately, working in corrections can only aggravate those demons. And we have to kind of be alert kind of see what's happening with the people that are closest around us and play that role with them. And basically it's, 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 it's not really, it goes above and beyond just motivating them to go back to work. It's really helping the individual uh, that's wearing the uniform, not helping the person become a better person in the uniform, but rather helping the individual as a whole. Corrections has a way not just to attack uh, how you're able to carry out your profession, but more of attack you as an individual. I mean, it could really uh, affect how you see the world, how you see yourself. I mean, it is that much of a uh, a tough profession to deal with on a day to day basis. So we as peer support have to take the time to work with the individual and, 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 the, and the working with the individual is just more of helping them cope 
with the stuff that they're going to deal with so they can be effective in life, not just effective for the job. A lot of times the peer support can be very superficial. You know, I'm going to help Russ. And then I write down, hey, by the way, Russ is clear to go to work tomorrow. That has nothing to do with him being cleared to go to work tomorrow. It, it's it's more about, is Russ okay, you know, mentally? So I think being the peer support, uh, you know, actually staying when someone does have a concern. Like if you're asking, how are you today? Are you going to stay for the response to see how that person really is? But I would say in corrections, uh, uh, more than any profession I would know, but I'm sure it's in other professions, uh, your active role as a peer support uh, person is essential, especially as we just talked about before, just even just being overwhelmed could require us getting together and just trying to see how we can help each other. Hey, you said, uh, you know, you got stuck a couple of days in a row. You know what? I'll work for you today. You know, oh, it's your son's birthday. I'll work for you today. So you can go to your son's birthday. I mean, there's ways that we can help people through it. Uh, but unfortunately, we may not have a way to solve it. But as peer support, we can help you work through it. So I, I said it in a video yesterday, you know, you kind of remove hope from the situation and put it back into the people. And next thing you know, I may not be able to promise you when things will end, but I promise you that we can do this together. And that's part of what that peer support uh, would entail. Uh, what's your thoughts on that? We'll go with Joe first and Russ being that peer support person. Uh, hold on, me unmute you. There you go. You unmuted? Yep. We're good. Yeah. You know, any anybody who's experienced anything in life um, through different situations knows what it's like. Um most of the times we can kind of recognize a sign in our peers when we know, you know, if, if, if we know if we're on a good team and, and we know each other um, well, um, we can recognize the signs of when something's just not right. Um, you know, uh, being there for each other is probably one of the, the biggest accomplishments and the biggest, uh, the biggest appreciations that I have for this profession because I've seen it too many times where, you know, one person was down and, and, you know, eight other people came to help and, and stepped up to the plate. Um, you know, it's, it's something that, that, you know, we can do for each other. It doesn't, you know, it, it, you don't have to be a Superman. You don't have to leap bounds and jump tall buildings. And, you know, the, the most, the most, uh, you know, minute of things, mean the most, you know, and, and it may not even be anything that you did. It may be something that you said, Hey brother, I, I know exactly what you're going through. I'm here. If you need a shoulder, if you need an ear, I'm here. You know, it, it could be something just as simple as that. Um, you know, to help out your, your coworkers when they're going through bad times. Um, you know, we're there to lean on each other to do the good and the bad. You know, when we have a bad day at work or a hard day you know, at the shift, you know, sometimes it's it's good to get out there in the parking lot after shift and blow off a little bit of steam and and and, you know, cut up and, and get some good laughter in before we all go home. You know, it's 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 our way of unwinding. But that's something simple that we can do for each other. You know, it doesn't have to be something that supervision does for subordinates. It's you know, we're we're all in this together. You know, we're all humans. We're all teamwork. We're all team players. You know, this is something that we need to do for each other. I agree. And what's your thoughts on that, Russ, with the peer support role? Um, yeah, you know, that's the, um, you know, the places that you're going to get support from are are going to be, uh, you know, your family at home. And the second place that you're going to get it is from your family at work. Um, like I, you know, said before, you know, not all facilities or departments are the same. But you know what, if if we can't count on each other, uh, to be there, um, this becomes a very difficult uh, type of profession, and that, you know that's and we're going to have things you know like like substance use and and alcohol abuse and things like that creep in anyway. Um, and I would just say you know uh, be sensitive to those around you, and you know look for the ones that might be struggling. You know, I'll tell I'll tell you you know right from the right from the get go, man, I would never give off any, any vibes of, you know, or maybe it's not, I wouldn't give off vibes, but I would not ask for help. And, you know, at times, even, even when I needed it. And so, you know what, just uh, do that, do that wellness check on them, you know, Hey, how's, how's it going? And don't leave it at just, you know, Oh, well, you know, living the dream, you know, get into some deeper conversations with them and, 
and really see what's going on because th- this is this is the one thing where we can actually have an impact without having to rely on uh, you know legislation or funding or things like that. Yeah, and 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 guys, as I said, I think this is something that is uh, what well, this is something we don't get paid to do. So this is something that is an intentional effort. Um, and but with that said, it goes more than just words. Most of the time, the peer support. Uh, is usually action driven. So you have to be prepared to step up and help and not just talk and say you will. Because I know a lot of people will say, yeah, I got you. I got you. In the moment, uh, the person really does need you. Uh, You're nowhere to be found or or you push it off to someone else. I mean, it's directed at you. Uh, You got to do your best and and, and step up. Uh, Two more left. Uh, Personality conflicts with staff or inmates. Uh, I, I'll, I'll, I'll start off on this one. So personality conflicts with inmates uh, really should not affect how you do your job. Uh, I'm not here to be Mr. Popular. I'm here to do what is expected and what is right. So I'm not really going to be engaged in any personality conflicts with inmates. If they don't like how I move, but I know I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing, then I don't care less. They're still going to have to respect what I do. Um, or at least honor what I do, being in, I'm in a position of authority. Uh, I expect that there's going to be a lot of things that they don't like how I do, and then they could turn that into a personality conflict where it's not. It's I'm doing my job. You don't like I'm doing my job. So the only personality conflict that we have here is I- I'm, I'm the professional one, and you're expecting uh, you know an easy way to do things. Uh, it's not going to happen. So having said that, with personality conflicts, I'm not really too involved. Uh, with personality conflicts because it shouldn't get that deep uh, with you and an inmate, but that doesn't mean it doesn't happen. But if it does happen, it's usually one-sided and you can direct it immediately. You know, there's no way that you should be that involved with an inmate uh, that you're having personality conflicts with them. They may have one with you or maybe uh, in, in their interpretation of what that personality conflict is, but you should never have one with an inmate. Uh, you just shouldn't. Now for staff, it's going to happen. Uh, staff, it, we're a little bit more engaged with. Uh, we may be a little bit more vulnerable with in some cases. So there could be moments where we have personality conflicts or there could be moments where we um, witness personality conflicts. Uh, if you're engaged in personality conflicts, the best advice I have for you is remove all assumption. Uh, if there's something being said, go to that person face to face and be a big boy or be a big girl and you know, settle those concerns because the problem is when you don't, the generalized assumptions get swept in the whirlwind of chaos. And uh, it just makes matters worse when you know automatically the best way to solve the problem is for you and that person just to speak. So if if me and Joe aren't getting along and people start fueling the fire, uh, I'm not going to wait for the fire to burn. I'm just going to go to Joe and say, hey, Joe, I heard this. Uh, You know, Joe, what's your thoughts? And I didn't say that. You know, and then you wind up just airing it out. I think a lot of reasons why people don't do that is because they're afraid of conflict. It's only going to get worse. So if you address it immediately, it's surface. You could see it. You could see that what's happening and you could stop it in the tracks. But if you don't, it's going to get worse. And that's going to turn into wind up being sabotaging each other or doing something foolish. And, and we just don't have time for that uh, in this type of environment. Also, if you're witness to it as third party, I'm telling you something, guys, when it comes to personality conflicts that I'm not involved in, I know people will try to bring you in. I remove myself from that. Even as a supervisor, I do not get myself involved in personality conflicts. What I do is I will make sure as long as there's no ethic concerns or nothing like that, that has to be deferred up. I will sit those two individuals down and say, you guys will work this out. I'll even bring a union rep and I'll step aside. Uh, But at the end of the day, know for a fact you're going to be held responsible for your professionalism. I don't give a shit who's right or wrong. And personality conflicts, there's a lot of people here that when they have a personality conflict, they try to spend all their energy trying to solve the, 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 or try to resolve the personality conflict. No, you don't do that. Uh, you, you don't have enough time to choose who's right or wrong. Your objective is I got to keep things moving. So I'm going to give you guys a chance to solve that matter yourself. But if, but if you can't solve it, I'm going to have to, at that point, hold you responsible. Now, for someone that's just getting into the profession, dealing with it, all I can say is this, because it's going to be different from your perspective. All I'm going to say is this, don't get yourself involved in it. That's all I'm saying. Don't be the go-between. Don't be, you know, hey, Anthony's not talking to Joe, so I'll just go ahead and, nope. 
because the moment you find yourself as the go-between, you're putting yourself in the mix. And then when shit hits the fan, you will also be involved. And you'll watch as the two people that are having the personality conflict, they're, they're fine, but then you got set up. You wind up being the issue. So all I can say is for personality conflicts, don't engage it. Try to remove yourself from it. And then basically, uh, I, I just seen personality conflicts take people down and it just gets upsetting to me because in corrections, I'm sure in any <laughs> environment, any workplace environment, there is no time for workplace personality conflicts. All it does is set us backwards. And then you have two professionals who really don't can't even solve any matters anymore. It's not because they don't know how. It's because they both refuse to, because at this point here, I'm not going to help the other party. And now all of a sudden, everything starts to fall. People are no longer picking up the ball. They're no longer taking the initiative. And then personality conflicts turn into the blame game, which eventually turns into sabotage. It, it's just It just rolls out like that. Uh, what's your thoughts on that, Russ? We'll go Russ first and Joe. Yeah, um, you know, uh, with regards to personality conflicts uh, with inmates, uh, don't have them operate within the uh, four corners of your duty and uh, in your job title and description. And that will save you a, a world of problems when you when you do that. Like I say, those four corners of your job duty and description stay inside that, you know, and and if it takes you a minute to think about what those are, then yeah, do them. Now, now, uh, inmates will bring conflict to you and try and make it about you. Um, be very cautious about that, uh, because there's something else going on when that happens, you know, they could be doing any number of things. They might be trying to set you up. They might be trying to distract you. They might be trying to, uh, you know, they might be trying to, you know, move some dope on the yard or to, you know, carry out a hit. The number of things that they will pull you into is endless though. So just, you know, be cautious and recognize when they're pulling you out from beyond those four corners that I that I talk about. And then uh, with regards to, uh, you know, personality conflicts uh, amongst your your uh, your peers or even your bosses and so forth, those things are going to happen. Uh, you know, I have some that uh, I know that I was totally in the right, some that I was probably totally in the wrong and some that. Um, I regret and others that I don't regret at all. Um, but you know what? I think that, um, I think that, you know, it's really incumbent upon you to try and to try and, uh, remain calm and cool about it. Um, I have a hard time with that because I'm, I'm very passionate about what I do. I'm very passionate about the positions that I take. Um, but that doesn't mean that, uh, that, that doesn't mean that those passions are always helpful to me in actually solving conflict. So uh, just be smart about it. Love that. And what, what's your thoughts, uh, Joe? Yeah, I mean, you, you got to take into account in this profession, we're probably, you know, this profession has probably the most eclectic group of people that are, you know, put together in, in one place. You know, you're going to have conflicts, you know, just because you think one way doesn't mean that everybody's going to agree with it. Um, you know, just as you may not agree with what other people think or say, um, you know, the biggest thing is to, to remain professional. I've always, you know, I've always told my staff, look, you know, we don't, we don't have to necessarily love each other. Um, but we are going to act as a team as long as we're here. Um, we're going to act professional with each other. We're going to be all on the same team. Um, and I, you know, and I, and I highly encouraged employees to try to work something out with each other before involving uh, supervision or, you know, getting me involved in it. Um, uh, you know, I, I would have no problem mediating, but, you know, we're going to do it professionally. And once we once we walk out, you know, it's over and we're going to be back on that same team. Um, you know, you're not and it's not just, you know, corrections, no matter what job you you're you're at, you know, you're going to have some sort of personality conflict with somebody at some point in time. It's just going to happen. Um, if you're afraid of conflict and you don't like conflict, you're definitely in the wrong profession. <laughs> this this profession in general is full of conflict. It, it may be staff driven, it may be inmate driven, but the conflicts are always going to be there. And it's something that we have to address. You have to do it, you know, immediate uh, and get it out of the way. Um, so you, you can, both, both parties can kind of go on with what they need to do. Um, 
you know, like I said, you know, we're given our, given our profession, you know, at, there's so many, so many different races, so many different personalities, so many different views, so many different, you know, this profession here probably has one of the most eclectic, cultural, diverse individuals in the profession. And, you know, not everybody thinks the same, you know, the, the only thing you can do is have some understanding for your partner or for your, for your coworker um, and understand their point of view. And doesn't necessarily mean you have to agree with it, but as long as you both understand it, you know, most of that conflict is already gone. That's that's the biggest thing. You know, one person wants the other person to understand their point of view more than the other. And, you know, that's where we we, we need to pay attention and work that out amongst ourselves. Um, you know, like Russ said, obviously, if you see somebody who's doing something so heinous and so dangerous that can get yourself or, or somebody, somebody hurt or killed, then by all means, please sound the alarm, you know, uh, whether smuggling contraband, weapons, phones, you know, definitely sound the alarm because that's that, that's not a conflict. That's a dangerous situation at that point. Yeah, and and, and guys, the last one is bad management. Uh, obviously, everyone's going to have a facility that probably has someone that just doesn't know how to lead correctly. Uh, I just want people to know that doesn't become an excuse to not take accountability for the things that you must take accountability for to keep you motivated to do the job. I have seen people blame bad management for everything and i get it we're gonna have it but then they start allowing bad management to affect their value and what they do their uh their ability to be fulfilled by the work they do and i think at that point here because we've covered this topic on multiple shows we don't have to go too specific here but you got to be weary of what you allow them in because my thing is working in corrections you want to have control uh, to some extent of um, your your daily uh, engagement with the job, uh, it's it matters. You know your investment, your ownership, your commitment. Um, when you start not stepping up, and you know you're not stepping up, so it's not something that sneak snuck up on you. You just know I'm not stepping up. And when someone asks you, well, why didn't you give this search 100 percent, or you know why aren't you doing your job as effective as you used to? Well, I can't work with Russ Hamilton anymore. Okay, well, well, okay, I get it. Russ Hamilton may not be the best uh, manager at this time or the best leader, but but again, I'm going to ask you again. Why did you not do the search as effective, knowing that the search that you're doing affects the safety of everyone that's around you? Or why are you not as engaged in this work, knowing that your engagement relates to your own safety and security and your own safety and security uh, and, the, and the safety and security of the people that are around you? So again, I get that people kind of gotten used to having this catch-all excuse of, 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 of why they don't want to be as engaged in this work anymore. But this is corrections. Uh, and, and unfortunately, you have to be committed every day, regardless of the asshole above you. I mean, if anything, be persistent and, 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 and don't let them get to you. But the point is, the moment you start to allow that to get to you and affects your engagement of the job, affects your investment, affects your commitment... Uh, well, the problem is you're not in control to fix it now because you feel it's better just to put the blame out there. And, and I think someone's going to catch you on that one day and someone's going to ask you because something could happen one day. Let's say someone does get hurt or killed and, and it was because maybe you failed to do a search properly. And then you go ahead and say, well, you know what? I just didn't do my search that day because, uh, you know, management just had me so pissed off that day. Oh, yeah. OK, that's good. Yeah, we'll listen to that. But having said that, uh you're still going to have to live with that guilt and you're still going to have to be faced with discipline related to what your failure was. So I think in my end here, you're going to deal with bad management. I, I, I wouldn't say to expect it because I, I don't want you to expect that. I want you to have some level of uh, realistic optimism that there are good people out there. So I don't want you to expect it because I don't want that bias to be set in. Uh, but I do want you to prepare for it because a lot of times, guys, people that say, that I'm working for bad management, they also don't tell you the specifics behind it. They just have the same thing, the generalized assumptions that are carried out that this person's bad because him and Joe had an interaction, but Joe's been only the one that's been able to share his story. We don't hear the story from management side. So we don't even know the truth uh, about if the person's really a bad manager or, or not. So I say the best point here is to have that open mind in all your interactions with individuals. Don't assume that the person's a ship manager because 
you know, someone else told you they are, you know, you deal with the person individually, you know, and also ask for why, you know, if things are happening that are changes that you may not understand and talk to the people directly. Uh, but either way, I just don't want this to be an excuse anymore because at the end of the day, we're sitting at conferences, we're getting ready to speak to people. And all of a sudden you give out all these good initiatives that make all the sense in the world. And then people just choose to say, well, you know what? I'm not even going to do that because such and such uh, is a crap manager and blah, blah, blah. It's like, yeah, but, but the good initiative is still a good initiative. It's still a good initiative, regardless of how you feel about that individual. So having said that, I think we got to shift away from the blame game and realize that, yes, we are going to be working around people that aren't the best for this profession. But now I have to do what I can to make sure that doesn't affect me personally or, more importantly, affect how I view what I'm going to be doing for the next 25 years. I will not allow someone that's a bad manager to affect how I feel about the work I got to do and carry out for at least – the next 25 years, 25 years of my life. Uh, so let's go with, sorry, let's go with Joe first because Russ got a code going on. Hey, what do you got, Joe? Sounds like Russ is having a use of force with his dog. Yeah. Uh, you know, yeah. I mean, every, every workplace environment is going to have a bad manager, you know, uh, and I get it. I've been there, you know, I pretty much retired because of one. Um, and I do understand the feelings However, um, a bad manager shouldn't be able to take your work ethic from you. That's yours and yours alone. That's something you have to own. You shouldn't let anybody's bad management alter the way you, your job performance. Um, you know, all we can do is do what we're supposed to do, stay within the bounds, um, you know, and, and, and do exactly what we're supposed to do, exactly what we've been doing prior to this bad manager getting there. You know, bad managers, 80% of them are bad managers because of lack of experience. You know, when I first got promoted to sergeant, I was a bad manager too. You know, it was all trial and error. That's where managers gain their experience from the trial and error to become better managers, to become better supervisors. Um, you know, so don't expect right off the bat just because somebody is put into a management position that they have the ability to to lead effectively because not every new promoted supervisor has that because you know some of us know the culture some of us have been the culture um and some of us haven't you know and and it you you got to kind of give them a little bit of leeway and understand that they're probably still feeling their way around too but at some point, we can't we can't always blame a bad manager for our actions. If we're the ones not doing our job, that's not that's not Russ's fault. That's not Ganji's fault. That's my fault. I'm not doing my job. It's got nothing to do with Ganji's an asshole supervisor, or or Russ is an asshole supervisor. So I'm not going to do my job. No, that, that at that point, blame is gone. The only person you should be blaming is yourself. So never, ever, ever, ever. Let somebody take you from being you. Do your job. Be fair about it, regardless of what the manager, you know, at, at some point, if you do it repetitive enough, that bad manager is going to know that they can't get to you because you're doing your job, regardless of what they hash down on you. You know, not not all managers are good. Not all managers are bad. I agree with that, Joe. Uh, I think that's, I love what you said, because at the end of the day, you are responsible. Uh, the big thing here is holding those inmates accountable. And, you know, I, I just think it's time that we shift away from that and start becoming a united force as opposed to gradually accepting it. And then when you do have that manager providing no resistance or some persistent resistance, because you may not turn them around the first time. Uh, but with that said, eventually through persistence, some of them will turn around. Uh, but again, I just want to mention, make sure that people may not even truly understand why they're not getting what they want. That's why we got to stop making assumptions and really going up and trying to figure it out. You post a question up about relationships and quick uh, people are quick to do that old divide. It's like, guys, listen, we, we got to get away from that because the people that are meant to advocate for us are those higher level managers. And all we're doing is pushing them away, pushing them away, pushing them away. And nine times out of 10, the people that have concerns about the managers never even interacted with the managers. All they hear is just hearsay. And instead of them trying to approach it and 
and and and get some answers, they wind up just settling back. And and I my officers, they came up to me. If there's a question, they'll come right up and you build clarity and they go back out and do their thing. I mean, that's the key. I think for me, that's what staff wants. Staff wants clarity and understanding. And as management, it's not about the orders you give, but is there a reason behind it that they can connect to? And that's your job as management to to connect it, but it's also the front line's job to also be opening, to have an open uh, mind when it comes to the things that uh, management has to push. Uh, at the end of the day, I, I think for the most part, we all want a safe day. It's just that the assumptions have gone so carried away where you actually got people actually believing that management wants them killed. You know, or 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 or, or management wants us to operate in a manner where it's not safe. Uh, where they don't understand the liability that happens when there is an incident. Management doesn't want the paperwork behind that. Of course they want a safe facility. I, I, I've never I've never met a manager that literally wanted an officer killed. You know, so these assumptions have gotten so crazy, so extreme that it, it's it's hard now to to bring things back. Uh, but having said that, when you do work with bad management, the best advice we said is really just to be immediate speak to them and, and then figure out what those concerns are. And of course we'll have some people that say, well, they don't want to speak to us. Okay. Then write an email, do something, you know, get something out there. But the point is when you go to ask them, have you ever tried? No, nah, they just don't want to speak to us, but you never tried. You haven't tried. So most of the time, the arguments that they have really are arguments uh, that really don't have the effort, but rather the assumption Uh that you know there'll be uh, no uh, no reception uh, to what the person is trying to claim. What's your thoughts on all this, Russ? Because it can go both ways. I'm just speaking from the other side. So you know, uh, Shakespeare said, "Brevity is the soul of wit," and I'm about to test that assumption. I think right now, without elaborating, after I say what I'm about to say, but. Uh, you know, the people out there listening to the sound of uh, our voices, uh, uh, of my voice uh, right now, um, you people are the leaders that Corrections has been waiting for. And I think I'll leave it at that. <laughs> Whoa, that was, oh, because we're in the, so so check this out. So the reason why yeah, we're, we're a little passionate about this topic because we do sit in management positions and we do care. And sometimes, you know, the, the assumption that we don't, you know, affects us. No different than if I made a wrong assumption about frontline, I would expect them to advocate uh, for their position. So having said that, the generalized animosity that separates us, uh, we can't allow it to be fueled because if you allow it to be fueled, it does end up in the extremes where, you know, we, we, you know, we don't care about our staff and all this other stuff. So you have to nip it before it rolls into that. Um, hey, do you have anything you'd like to say in closing? Uh, we'll start with Joe first. Yeah, absolutely. You know, we, we, we do these videos because we want the frontline officers to be better prepared for things that they see um, and, and are going to experience in, within the prison environment. Things that, you know, that were, that are beneficial now that we didn't have access to when, when we came into the system. Um, you know, nobody told me that, you know, half the stuff that I experienced that <laughs> I was going to experience. You know, so we put these videos together to, for the frontline people to to give them a better understanding and, and, and hopefully give them better tools in their toolbox to use for, you know, their careers. And, you know, I hope that we were we're able to do that for you. Um, you know, uh, mine, Russ's, Gandhi's emails or, or, you know, addresses are out there. You know, don't ever be afraid to, to reach out. Um, there's no such thing as a stupid question. Um, I'll be happy to answer them all day long and give you the best advice that I have based on my experiences. Um, you know, just be prepared mentally to know that you're going to see things in a prison environment that you probably weren't taught in academy. You probably weren't told about, you know, at the job interview um, that you weren't told about at the job fair. Um, this is this is a tough profession. Um it's it's demanding of your time it's demanding of your mental you know you know it's demanding of you uh mentally uh physically sometimes um and and know that there's going to be some tough times but depending on your attitude and the way you adjust yourself and, and go with the flow um you can also make it the best of times too 
Mm. Powerful, Joe. And Rush, what do you got in closing, Russ? Um, yeah, you know, these are just, you know, all things that um, that we all have to deal with. Um, and you know what? There, there's no getting around it. And these things are uh, hard, uh, conflictual, sometimes disturbing, sometimes horrifying. Uh, sometimes scary and uh, but it's all part and parcel this is this is what we signed up to do this is why we raised our hand and uh, and took an oath and so uh, you know this is this is a great profession and uh, you know like Joe said um, one thing I think that's uh, that, that can be said about all of us that um, you know participate uh, with regards especially to um, to tear talk and, and keepers of chaos is that we're accessible. We're there to to answer uh, questions anytime we can. And uh, so, you know what? Throw them at us. You know, maybe it'll maybe it will uh, inspire us to make a video or something. So uh, anyway, you know, just take care and take this stuff under advisement and uh, and put it to good use. You know, that's 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 really what we want. Yeah, guys, again, this is just, you know, it's it's surface. I'm sure there's other things we'll have to see and deal with. And we provided our best to have both perspectives, but I do know the perspective that we provide here is to motivate a more connected workforce. I mean, the key here is to get rid of these generalized animosities and just kind of move forward with facts and not assumptions. Uh, but again, uh, this is just thoughts and of, of, of stuff that we've dealt with, uh, how we internalized it, what we thought we could do to help us be more effective. So hopefully you get value of it. And as always, guys, the show is Talk. If you haven't, please subscribe, interact, engage, comment, hit that bell. Bell's going to notify you every time I post a video. Stay safe.